happy little games. When you think of Russians in entertainment, whether it be Hollywood blockbusters or video games, nine times out of ten, they are always depicted as large, imposing, and they weren't very nice, they were very evil. From Ivan Drago, I must break you. To Street Fighter Zangief, if a Russian is introduced, then you knew what to expect. Today, we are going to talk about a certain individual who was one of the first mascots for the company of Data East. In his debut appearance, he was seen as a hero, although in subsequent appearances, he has drifted over to the dark side. Sometimes portrayed as a Russian strongman, sometimes a Japanese big man wearing pointy shoes, but regardless of his midlife crisis, he was always spitting fire. He is the one, he is the only, Karnov. This mountain of a man would go on to make numerous appearances in various Data East games and become a beloved character in the annals of video game history. Who is the real person that Karnov was based on? What dancing game did Karnov bust a move in? Who is Karnov's brother and what arcade game did he star in? Let's find out as we learn about the history of Karnov. In 1987, arcade manufacturer Data East were still riding high with their successful line of arcade games. They had produced such hits as Ring King, Express Raider, and Breakthrough. And we're looking to continue with another action filled title. The weird and wacky gameplay of Karnov actually goes back to a previously little seen 1987 Data East game by the name of Captain Silver. This is a side scrolling hack and slash platform game that sees you take control of a young sailor by the name of Jim Aykroyd who goes on a long journey to seek out the treasure of Captain Silver. Now even though this is technically a pirate game, one of the levels sees you in a haunted house fighting off various creatures such as werewolves, pink cats, bats, wizards, and witches. There's also a huge infestation of crabs, the likes of which I haven't seen since high school. You will, of course, traverse a pirate ship with enemy pirates and a bald strongman with pointy shoes who looks a lot like Karnov. There is also a lot of jumping and climbing as well as collecting various objects. The game has the ghosts and goblins syndrome because you have to play through the game twice in order to see the true ending. When it came time to design their next arcade game, the developers wanted to create a fast paced run and gun platformer which sees you take on the role of Jim Borov Karnofsky or Karnov for short, as you set out across the landscape known as Wonderland. The character of Karnov was based on one of the bosses at Data East, right down to his bald head and bulging belly. He was not made aware of this until after the game was released and he was furious. Over the years, the character has morphed from a Russian strongman to a Japanese big man looking very similar to the madman from Sudan, Abdullah the Butcher, right down to his scarred head, red pants, and curled up shoes. Karnov was released by Data East in the arcades in 1987. As the story goes, you take on the role of Karnov as he ventures out across the land retrieving fragments of an ancient treasure map. Once the map is complete, you will have your fill of gold and diamonds and sapphires. The game is a one or two player run and gun with elements of platforming mixed throughout. You take control of the titular hero as you make your way through nine stages of insane intense action with a boss at the end of each one. 
you have a button for firing, a button for jumping, and an option button for selecting your power-ups. You have to be on your toes because the enemies are relentless and if you take a single hit, you will die. To deal with the onslaught of enemies that are looking to take you down, you have the ability to spit fireballs from your pie hole. To aid you in your quest, there are power-ups littered throughout the nine levels. Some of these are red orbs which will upgrade your fireballs to three per spit. On each level, a number of different items can be picked up and used along the way. These include jump boots, which allows Karnov to run faster and jump higher, a bomb, which will destroy enemies and certain floors and walls leading into hidden areas, a ladder, which is used to move it on up like George and Wheezy, a boomerang that will destroy most enemies in one hit and can be retrieved after having been thrown, and a super flame which changes the standard fireball into a deadly fire breath which does significantly more damage. Other items can only be activated in special areas of certain levels including wings which allows Karnov to fly through the air with the greatest of ease, a scuba helmet which gives the roly-poly big man the ability to swim as if he were Michael Phelps. A mask which will blink indicating that hidden items are nearby. And a trolley which lets you ride on and roll over the enemies that are on the ground. In addition to the red orbs you can collect, there are also letter K icons that can be picked up. If you collect 50 of these icons, you will earn an extra life. The enemies themselves are quite the varied bunch with everything from mummies, skeletons riding ostriches, killer owls, oversized clams, dinosaurs, and much, much more. Enough can't be said about the unique, assorted enemy designs and you really need to play through the whole game to experience it for yourself. That is, if you enjoy a little bit of pain with a little bit of pleasure. This game, while fun, is also extremely difficult with enemies crawling out of the woodwork. You are allowed approximately 200 seconds per level, and while that may sound like a lot, it really isn't. If you find yourself lingering around and not moving, a poisonous plant will descend from the sky to squeeze the stuffing out of you until you die. Due to the brutal difficulty, they did include a checkpoint at certain spots throughout the levels. Collectibles and power-ups are hidden high and wide, so sometimes it's necessary to pull out your trusty but perhaps rusty ladder in order to reach them. Nearly all the levels feature branching paths with different collectibles and enemy patterns. The graphics are fairly detailed, but they are let down by the dull color palette. As far as the music goes, there is only one main jingle that plays throughout the game, but at least it's memorable. The nine levels you encounter are Prologue, Ancient Ruins Beware. On to the forest. Over the Rocky Hills. Ride the Waves.
The whole town awaits. Beyond the pyramids lie the treasure. Whistling wind in the hollows. And the final level is heavy gates and moats, the last fortress. The bosses you will encounter are Merman, Trainer and Lions, Scorpion Woman, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and finally, the Wizard. If you successfully take down the Wizard and retrieve the last piece of the map, you are rewarded with enough treasure to make Scrooge McDuck green with envy. There were a few differences between the American and Japanese versions of the arcade game. The Japanese version has the option bar at the top and the scoring at the bottom, whereas the American flips it with the option bar on the bottom and the scoring at the top. The game is even more difficult here in the States thanks to more enemies on screen at once to take you out. There are other minor changes such as the location of the treasures being changed. While the game was successful in the land of the rising sun, over here in the states, not quite so much with most people being more familiar with the NES conversion instead. We did receive some merchandise including a Tiger LCD handheld game, as well as a couple of Karnoff minifigures from NeuterVision. Speaking of action figures, I did stumble across a couple of cool Karnoff custom jobs. The first one is an awesome piece which is based on the NES box art. Another fantastic custom that uses the pants and boots from Abdullah the Butcher, the head from the Iron Sheik, and the body from King Kong Bundy. Mix them all together and you get the big bad fire breathing mamma jamma known as Karnov. Karnov never did receive any official sequel, although he has popped up in cameos over the years. In the Data East fighting game Fighter's History, he appears as the final boss in the game. He would also receive top billing in the sequel to Fighter's History by the name of Karnov's Revenge. This is a well-rounded and overall better fighter than his predecessor, so if you've never had the chance to try it out, you owe it to yourself to do so. He was also featured in the third Fighter's History game as well. Some of the other games Karnov has made cameos in are Joe and Mac Returns, Gaio Ratsudin, Trio the Punch, Street Hoop in which he is seen standing in the background enjoying a nice game of basketball. He also has a letter K right on his shirt. Bad Dudes in which he is the first boss that you fight. A modified version of the Karnov Sprite was also used in the Data East arcade title Sly Spy. Tumble Pop and both Karnov and Chelnov appear in the crowd and win Jammers 2. Thanks to Cornovember, the character has gotten a lot of love, especially on the homebrew front. 
One of my favorites is Karnov's Rage, which is a Streets of Rage 2 hack that puts Karnov in the title role. Now I've seen some strange homebrew in my day, but one of the strangest would have to be the web game Dance Dance Karnov. This is a rhythm based game that sees you take on the role of Karnov in which you have to press the arrow keys in order to see the big man bust a move. The game is only two levels and starts out as a fun little parody of Dance Dance Revolution, but on the second level it becomes much more adult oriented once Karnov takes a trip down to Tasseltown. Don't play this around the kitties my friends. In 1991, the arcade game Big Karnak was released by Jalico. One of the first enemies that you encounter is identical to the Karnov sprite that was used in Bad Dudes, only with different colors and pants. This sprite has also been given lots and lots of Rogaine because he has a full head of luscious locks. In 1988, Data East released Atomic Runner Chilnov in the arcades. This is a one or two player run and gun which gives you tons of weapons letting you blast anything you come across. The reason this game is important is that one of the developers on Karnov has said that both he and Chelnov were related in some fashion. In 2005, a 30 minute short film by the name of Karnov was released based on the post video game adventures of our hero. It is goofy to say the least. number of home conversions were produced with the 8-bit computer ports done by Mr. Micro and released by Electric Dreams. The initial conversion that the team worked on was the Zenic Spectrum port, with the Amstrad and Commodore 64 version being worked on afterwards. But more on that in just a minute. The first version we are looking at is the Spectrum port. I was pleasantly surprised with this one as it turned out rather well. The graphics are large with detailed sprites and minimal color clash. Not only are the graphics large and in charge, but they are animated quite nicely. With that being said, the scrolling is a bit herky-jerky and the gameplay tends to slow down when there is a lot of action. Although the sound effects are minimal, there is a nice rendition of the arcade's main jingle. Everything from the arcade game has been included from the bosses to the full ending. The Amstrad version is up next, but unfortunately it is just a port of the Spectrum, but it does have a few more colors here and there. The speed of the game is a bit faster than the Spectrum, but it also has some slowdown when the action is hot and heavy. The sound effects are your typical air biscuits, but thankfully you can disable them. The controls are fairly responsive and similar to the Spectrum, everything from the arcade game has been transferred over.
when the Commodore 64 version was previewed in magazines that looked like a standard 8-bit platformer made especially for the machine. What we ended up getting was far from it. The developers ended up overextending themselves not only with this particular conversion, but a number of other projects that were in the works as well. They assumed they had allocated enough time to complete the project, but they were given just a few weeks in order to meet the deadline. So the Commodore users ended up being treated to this poor Spectrum port, which is an abomination. This is, without a doubt, one of the worst arcade conversions on the good old Commodore 64, and is right up there with hard driving and Chase HQ in terms of quality. If you ever looked lovingly at the Spectrum version of Karnov and wished you could play it at half speed, then this is the game for you. One thing I have always wished for my Commodore games was to have a little bit of that Spectrum Color Clash, so finally my wishes have come true. The Color Clash isn't as bad on the 64, but it's still there. The Adventures of Karnov has a little bit of that moon gravity going on with extremely floaty jumps. The scrolling of the screen is also infuriatingly bad. Where oh where has my lovely Sid Chip gone? There is no music and the sound effects sound like a curdled queef. If you can believe it, the controls are absolutely terrible. In my honest opinion, I would not recommend this game. Data East Software released the MS-DOS conversion here in the States and it was converted by Quicksilver Software. This conversion is a decent enough attempt for an early MS-DOS game. Upon startup, you'll notice that the play window is a lot smaller than the arcade game but everything also has a squished look to it. The sprites are detailed despite their knee-high size and everything looks pretty good. The scrolling is still a bit choppy, but the gameplay is fast. The sound effects and music use the dreaded Infernal PC speaker with the main arcade jingle, if you can call it that, on a continuous loop. While the game plays decent enough, there are some things that hinders it, such as some very strange collision detection. One of the better home conversions for the PC market was for, believe it or not, the Macintosh. The graphics are very detailed and the animation and scrolling are not too bad. If Karnov is going to run around shortlist then he should invest in some sunblock because he is as red as a lobster. There is some slowdown when jumping but it's nowhere near as bad as some of the other home computer ports. There is absolutely no sound in this version whatsoever. The developers were even nice enough to include a practice mode so you can try out almost any level. The emulator I was using was not playing nicely with my video recording software so I was not able to get any footage. The version most home users were familiar with was the Famicom and NES releases. The graphics have been definitely shrunk down, which allows for a smoother gameplay experience on the humble 8-bit Nintendo hardware. The level design is more or less the same as the arcade game with some slight alterations here and there. The color palette is very murky with everything having a dull sheen to it. There are some significant differences between not only the arcade game but both the NES and Famicom releases. As far as the actual gameplay goes, the game is quite a bit easier than its arcade counterpart. You can now take two hits before you die. After you take the first hit, Karnov will turn blue and if he is hit once more, he will die. If you pick up a super fireball while being blue, your health will be restored. 
The trolley power-up has been replaced by the clapboard and stages 4 and 8 are completely different from the arcade game. The NES version also has unlimited continues whereas the Famicom only has two secret continues. The big difference in the Famicom version is that there is a brand new story. There is an intro, cutscenes, and ending which were all missing from the USA release. The storyline in the Famicom version deals with Karnov's village being decimated by a dragon named Alakatai. The villagers pray to God and he sends an Avenger to retrieve the treasure and save the day. The US version removes all of the religious overtones and changes the story quite a bit as well. According to the manual, the village of Crimina has seen its treasures being raided by a whack pack of demonic baddies. The townsfolk turn to local strongman Karnov to venture out into the countryside to slay the dragon, rescue the treasure, and save the day. Again, this is all based on the manual for the game because there is no story whatsoever in the actual game. Even the cutscenes between each level that shows your progress via the map have been removed. When you beat the US version of the game, all you receive is a simple text box saying congratulations and that is it. Although this time in the NES version, you do get to fight a dragon at the end of the game instead of just a simple wizard. Thankfully, someone has translated the Famicom ROM so we can all enjoy and appreciate it here in the States. Karnov was a definite hard game to love thanks to its brutally insane difficulty. I would put it right up there with Ghosts and Goblins as I was never able to finish either one in the arcades back in the day. It's amazing that the character of Karnov has since become so popular despite never having a proper sequel. If you've never had a chance to become a god of war and spit a few fireballs here and there, be sure and give this game a shot. You'll be glad you did. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. If you would like to contribute but not sign up for my Patreon, you can always click the donate button up above. Thanks everyone for watching.